Everybody else is so much taller. You guys are blessed. Good evening, church. How many of you were late this morning? Anybody oversleep? There's a few people, yeah? How many of you are tired today? You guys are, huh? Nobody else? I'm tired. <laughs> I'm going to butcher tonight. Huh? It's like, I was, we were driving down here and I was trying to talk to Jan and I couldn't even get half my words out. So I'm probably going to say some pretty funny things tonight, but that's okay. I have an excuse. You guys don't. I'm brain damaged. <laughs> okay. Let's try this again. Good evening, church. There we go. It's good to see you. Love being with you guys. We just love, we're so blessed to be able to come down here and share the evening with you. And uh, it's just wonderful. Miss, missing a lot of people today. You know, it's sunny. The car said it was 82 degrees already on the way in here. That's like my max temperature. I don't like it when it gets above that. So we can pray that uh, maybe we don't have much warmer weather than that this summer. I don't know. So we'll see. So tonight, we did it. One, two, three, three and a quarter. Three and a quarter pages of Bible. We've been studying First Peter since the end of June. And we're going to finish tonight. Anybody excited about that? This, no? Yeah? Okay, good. There's a lot of good stuff in this short little book, isn't there? It's amazing that we can, well, maybe it's just me, but we can spend a lot of time talking about what's in here. But we're going to finish up. And uh, tonight, um, Peter's going to give us um, a bit of warning, a final bit of warning. And then he's going to give us a lot of encouragement, and I think that's wonderful. So we've entitled tonight's message, Standing Firm in God's Grace. And uh, I love some of the testimonies that, that people shared with us tonight, because it's all about standing firm in God's grace. If we trust him, we obey him, we allow him to lead and realize as Jesus told us in, in the Gospel of John, that apart from him, we can do nothing. That, you know, we, we can only expect that if we try to do stuff on our own, then we're not going to do anything. But if we get on our knees, if we pray, if we seek him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, he's going to bless us, and it's, it's going to be wonderful. So let's stand. We'll read and pray. So First Peter... Chapter 5, verses 8 is where we're starting. We're going 8 through 14. So Peter says, Be sober-minded. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Let's read that again. After you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you into his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. By Silvanus, a faithful brother, as I regard him, I have written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. She who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends you greetings, as does Mark, my son. Greet one another with the kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. Our Heavenly Father, we just, uh, we thank you and praise you, Lord, that you have a house that you, you collect us in. And that, Lord, as individuals, we make up living stones in your house that 
together, Lord, you build us into a wonderful, wonderful church, a temple, a body, a people. And we're here to proclaim how great you are. So Lord, we just, as we study your word tonight, Holy Spirit, open our hearts, our souls, our minds. Enlighten us. Give us wisdom. Give us discernment. And most of all, Lord, give us a passion, a passion to do the things that you've called us to do. Because if we abide in you, we can do everything. So we lift this evening to you, Lord God. We just uh, pray, Holy Spirit, that you be with us. Just descend upon your house. Overwhelm us with your love and your grace and your mercy. It's in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. This is interesting. We've just kind of transitioned now in a bit of thought. And Peter says, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Now, I find this, this turn of thought really fascinating because Peter has just concluded, if you remember in the beginning of this chapter, a line of thought on how God's house should behave. How everyone, from the elders to the newest believer and everybody in between, he's been telling us that because judgment begins here, we need to act in a certain way. And that so we need to, to, to be humble before one another. And that we need to love one another. And that we need to lift up all our prayers and cast every anxiety on him. And that Immediately after this, he tells us that, oh, by the way, look out. Look out, because Satan's out there, and he's going he's gonna to start attacking. And as I think about this, and I prayed about this, is it, why, this is just really interesting. So why is this? Why? Why will Satan attack us? Well, the first thing I believe is that if our church is healthy, if our body is healthy, and that, that means that all of us together will be doing the things that God has called us to do. And when we do the things that God has called us to do, well, Satan's going to attack. He doesn't like it when the church is doing the things that, that brings glory to God, that brings light into this world, because he hates the light, he loves the darkness. So that's the first thing. The second reason is, is if we're humble before God, we cast all our anxieties on him, that means we're putting our full faith and trust in him. And so Satan is going to do everything he can to try to, to put a, a, a wedge between us and God. He, want, he doesn't want us to trust our Lord. He wants us to be fearful. He wants us to have doubts. So he's going to attack. And then the third reason that I came up with is, well, Satan's going to attack because Satan's just a jerk. He's just, he's just, if, if Satan were walking in here tonight, he would be that guy that we don't like. He's just negative. He's a downer. He's always trying to divide people, get them to gossip and, and curse one another. And he's just a jerk. He's not a nice guy. So that's in his nature. He is the prince of the air, the, he is the prince of darkness, and he is going to do everything he can to, to set us off the tracks. So, again, Peter, Satan is just going to attack, and Peter's warning us about that. So, it's interesting then. So, we need to be, if we're serving Christ, we need to be on the watch out for this. He says we need to be sober-minded. We need to be watchful. Another word for watchful is to be vigilant. And we need to be constantly on the lookout for Satan's attacks. And this, this comes in a lot of ways. We can't afford to just be spiritually lazy. And I think I've shared this with you before, but any time that we step out to do things in faith, then things are going to happen. Just They might just be minor things, but things are going to happen to kind of try to trip you up. If you're married, there's going to be a little thing that comes up that will cause you to squabble with your wife or if you have kids, your kids are going to do things, that are, and, and you, can just, you can just count on the fact that if you're watchful, if you're looking out, you can realize that Satan's sticking his dirty little fingers in there and causing these problems. 
He prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. So he's just going to do everything he can. And, and remember who wrote these verses. Peter wrote this. And of all the people in the Bible, I think that Peter really understands this concept. You know, we like to, I don't know that we like to pick on Peter, but Peter's a perfect example, well, in a lot of ways, of you and I. Because I don't think he fails any more than, than I know I would have failed in this situation, and probably you too. So remember the night before Jesus went to the cross, he told Peter this, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan demanded to have you that he might sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned again, strengthen your brothers. Now this is really interesting. Because Jesus is saying, look, Jesus is saying, Satan's going to attack you. He's asked for you. But I'm praying for you. And this is really neat. So think about this. Throughout Peter's time as he walked with Jesus, Jesus said, come on, follow me. What did Peter do? Well, he followed him, but did, was he really sold out for Jesus at the beginning? I don't really think so. He's like, there's something really cool about Jesus. I want to follow him. I want to. Does that sound like you, like me? A lot of times, we're going, I want to do this, Lord, but there's a little bit of reservation we put there. When Jesus said, come out on the water with me. Walk on the water, Peter. Peter's like, okay, there's my Lord. I'm going to walk out. And then he's like, wait, wait, what am I doing? I'm walking on water. You can't walk on water. So he began to sink. Why? Because Satan was there. He was prowling around like a roaring lion. He said, Peter, what are you doing? Who is that guy? Who? He's just another guy. Why, why do you think you can walk on water? Men can't walk on water. And he started sinking. Peter, is that guy really the Messiah? Is he really? He put fear into his heart. He put doubt into his heart. And that caused Peter to sink. But look at 30, verse 32 up there again. But I have prayed for you. This is Jesus saying this. I have prayed for you that your faith may not fail. That's awesome. The Savior of the world cares enough for us that he will pray for us. He intercedes for us before God. And I think that gave Peter fantastic confidence, great confidence and comfort, knowing that Jesus was praying for him. It should do the same thing for us. I'm amazed as I read those things that Jesus, who knew all of Peter's faults and weaknesses, was praying for him. Jesus knows all of my faults and all my failures, and he prays for me. And he does the same for you. He knows all the struggles and temptations we're going to face, and he prays for us that our strength may not fail and that our faith would be strong. Peter knew after this, especially after he was recommissioned on the beach, that Jesus really cared for him. And I think the, that what Paul wrote probably really, really resonated with Peter. He said, if God is for us, who can be against us? And I have a question for you. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Do you believe that Jesus is continually interceding for you? That he's, he cares for you? And that he's in a constant state of war? against the Satan for you? I do. I believe that. And if you do, then the answer is what Peter tells us. Then he says, resist him, Satan. Resist him firm in your faith. So there's a progression there that's pretty neat. Now, it's always scary when you're coming up against an adversary. And, and Satan is scary. I mean, if we didn't have Christ in our lives, if we didn't have Holy Spirit living in us, I would be terrified to come up against Satan. 
But we do have him in us, and he is greater than he is, he is in the world. So Peter says, stand firm. This is an interesting word, because the Greek is anthistemi, which means to set oneself in opposition to, or to oppose someone. So standing firm isn't just standing your place, but it's actually a proactive, I'm going after this guy. Standing firm against Satan. We don't have any reason to. Why? Well, as Paul said, we have this thing called, as Arthur mentioned earlier, the full armor of God. We have all these things. And I want you to notice something about this. The armor of God. We have the helmet of salvation. We have the breastplate plate of that. I told you I was going to butcher words tonight. The breastplate of righteousness. The shield of faith. We have the sword of the spirit. We have the belt of truth. Sandals of peace. We have this. We're to put this armor on and dress. But I want you to notice something about this armor. What does it protect? If you were to dress in that stuff, what part of your body does it protect? Huh? Well, nah, not really. If you think about how those things were on, all the stuff, the armor and everything, the shield, all that, is for the front. It's for the front of your body. If you turn around to flee, guess what? You're unprotected. So when you put on the, the armor of God, you're equipped to go into battle, not to flee from Satan. So it's an interesting thing. You need to pick up that sword of the spirit as Satan's shooting those flaming arrows at you and, and just wah, take that, Satan. It says that he's going to flee from us. So when he fires that arrow, whoosh, here, let me tempt you with something. I know that... Oh, Gary, let me put a shiny new Mustang in front of you. Let me tempt you with that. Then the next thing you need to do, I need to do, is go, okay, Satan, I know I'm tempted by that, and I struggle with, with coveting that, and that's okay. You know what? I'm going to pray for the fact that I'm covetous, and I'm going to pray for every person that I know that has a, pr a problem with covetousness. Or let's say you're a person that tends to, to have um, greed, and you want money, and he puts an opportunity of, of something in front of you where you could make a lot of money, and it's kind of a shady deal. Well, then you just recognize that. And you go, Satan, I'm not going to take that. I'm going to pray for everyone that would be lured and tempted by this, and Satan will flee. The other thing you can do, if he shoots these arrows at you, and you just realize, like, Jan and I, we, we were kind of, we were going a little, at it a little bit, and we just stopped and started praying. So Satan can't be there when we're praying. It's that sword of faith. Just, boom, get out of here. Get out of here. So if you're standing sort of firm in your faith, just swing that sword of the Spirit at him, and he will flee. Wayne Grudem put it this way. He said, the command, resist him firm in your faith, signifies that defeat is not inevitable. To put it in a simpler term, Satan can't defeat us if we're in Christ. Christians must resist, expecting that the enemy will flee. So if we resist, we expect, and God will honor that, Satan will flee. God's kingdom will advance, they will grow in faith and holiness through conflict. There's another reason we, we're here to fight. As we stand and we, we trust in Christ and we start swinging that sword of the Spirit at Satan and he flees, well then our faith is strengthened and we learn to lean more and more into Christ. And God will take Satan's plans for evil and turn them to good. It's awesome. It's a wonderful thing. So, Peter finishes off this, this sentence here by saying, Knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brother, brother, brotherhood throughout the world. In other words, so we have Satan. He's going to attack, especially if we're doing the things. And guess what? 
That's going to happen to every one of us in this room that walks with Christ. Satan's not going to like it. It's going to happen to every member of every other church in this city, in this state, in this country, in the world. Every Christian that's being obedient to Christ's leading is going to affect, just can expect to come up against Satan. It's just the way it is, but it's not a big deal because we have all this armor of God. Now, a little bit of a cautionary note here. If you're a Christian, it's not necessarily the case, depending on where you are in your walk, because the Lord won't let us be attacked beyond where we can take things. But if you've been a Christian for 30 years, 20 years, 10 years, and everything's always been sun and roses for you, that might be a time to stop and take a little stock in your life, in your walk with the Lord. Because if, if you're not finding that Satan's coming up against you, then I might be a little bit worried about whether or not I'm truly walking with the Lord and doing anything for the kingdom. But on the other hand, if you find that you're being attacked, hopefully not daily, but weekly, monthly, take heart in that. It's never fun. It's never fun to come under Satan's attacks. But it is a cause for rejoicing because that means you are having an effect for God's kingdom and for his glory. And you're facing opposition from him. So it is, in a perverse way, a reason to uh, rejoice. And then this is really cool. After you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace who called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. Remember, remember who wrote these words. The same Peter that, that knew it. Can you imagine... We always talk about Peter's failures, but we don't really talk about how he felt after those things. And just as a man, I could just only imagine how Peter felt all along the time that he's walking as one of Christ's disciples, and he keeps kind of messing things up. Think about the Mount of Transfiguration. Peter's always trying to, you know, out of his flesh, trying to do the right thing and be bold. And so Moses is there and Elijah and Jesus and, and, and Peter's just being Peter going, wow, this is really cool. Hey, how about I build a tent for all of you? And, and Peter didn't really re re realize it, but when he said that, he was putting Jesus on the same plane as Moses and Elisha. Now, obviously, there's an order of magnitude of difference there. So what happens? God himself, God the Father, rebukes Peter, right? God the Father basically said, hey, Peter, Jesus isn't like Moses or Elijah. He's my beloved son. And I'm well pleased with him. So Peter, maybe you ought to shut up and kind of listen to what my son Jesus says. And I can't imagine what, you know, Peter's like, oh my goodness. You imagine how he felt there? Or what about when, when Jesus is sharing with the disciples that he has to go to the cross? And Peter's being Peter, and he's trying to do the right thing in his flesh. He goes, no, Lord, you will never die. And what does Jesus say to him? Get behind me, Satan. Jesus called Peter Satan. I can't imagine how Peter felt. Or the night of the Last Supper. Jesus is washing everyone's feet, and Peter's feeling guilty because he didn't pick up the bowl and wash everyone's feet. And Jesus gets there to wash his feet and says, No, Lord, you'll never wash my feet. And what does Jesus say? If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Ugh. Poor Peter. Poor Peter. 
And then shortly after that, they go into the garden to pray. And Peter and John are specifically singled out. He says, you guys, come, come on, pray with me. And what's Peter do? He can't even pray. And then, and then shortly after that, the denial. Are you a little bit like Peter? I am. Have you failed to obey Jesus' promptings in something? Have you failed to trust him when he's called you to do something? I have. Have you ever done anything that really even makes you question whether or not you're saved or if you're really a, quest a Christian at all? I have. I'm sure those are the same things, the same feelings that Peter had. But you know what? Read that verse again. After you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, and strengthen you and establish you. That's amazing, guys. He knows how much we're going to mess up. He knows every struggle, every failure. And he's going to say, it's okay. Come on. I'm going to take care of this. He's used Peter mightily. And he wants to use us mightily in his power and strength also. John Corson put it this way. I don't have the full quote on there. But he said, Peter failed at every point. But here's the good news. He was used mightily even after his failings because he understood that which, that which he shares with us in verse 10. It's not impeccability that's necessary. In other words, we don't have to be perfect. It's teachability. We need to be humble and be able to learn. I have failed. You have failed. This is John Corson saying this. Yet, if, like Peter, we learn lessons from our failures, we can speak with authority. We can say to others, I've been there. I've done that. I've made mistakes. You don't have to. If, as a mom or a dad, a Sunday school teacher, an elder or a leader at work, you are aware of your shortcomings, if you're not careful, you will think that they disqualify you from sharing with others. But guess what? They don't. Take hope from Peter. He failed at every point, yet when he learned his lesson, he did not fail again. It's God's grace that will establish, confirm, and strengthen you as long as you learn the lessons God has for you. Isn't that amazing? He'll take care of it for us. As long as we're obedient, we're seeking to serve him, hey, Water under the bridge. Water off a duck's back. It doesn't matter. He'll take care of you for it. And then Peter closes with, To him be dominion forever and ever. Amen. Yeah, thank you, Jesus, for taking care of us that way. For caring about us so much that, that you will establish and restore us and, and strengthen us. It's just so amazing. So standing firm in God's grace. Verse 12, by Silvanus, a faithful brother as I regard him, I have written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. Another stand firm. Okay, commentators believe that uh, Luke also called Silvanus Silas. So he was involved in Paul's ministry as well as with Peter's. And it's a little bit of a debate as to who he actually was. Um, in what kind of involvement they did. But a lot of commentators think that um, Peter it wasn't the Ammonaeus. He wasn't the scribe that wrote this letter, but he actually carried this letter to uh, the churches in Pontus, in Cappadocia, and Galatia, Asia, and Bithynia. 
But so what's really cool in this verse, though, that really struck my mind, because it's, it's really neat that he commends Sylvanus, a faithful brother. But he says, I have written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. And as we come to the end of this study in Peter, I thought it would be a good thing to review what things are the true grace of God. And in these three, one, two, three, three and a quarter pages that we've studied, if you want to, if you're a quick leader, you can kind of flip along. But we have some points of what it means to stand firm in God's grace. For one thing, you are in elect exile, a sojourner in this world. That's part of God's grace. You have been sanctified by the Spirit. This is all in this book we've been studying. You have been born again of an imperishable seed. You have a living hope. You have an imperishable inheritance kept in heaven specifically for you. You're being guarded by God's power through faith. Your tested faith is precious to God. You have a joy that's inexpressible. The prophets and angels yearned to know the things that have been revealed to you. You have been set apart from the world. God knew his plan for you and for your salvation before the foundation of the world. You're a living stone in God's spiritual house. You're part of his, his chosen nation, his royal priesthood, his holy nation. We're his people and he's given us mercy. You will suffer trials in this life, but you'll bring him glory when we suffer in a way that's pleasing to him. You're stewards of God's grace. God's glory and grace rest on you when you're insulted for the name of Christ. Am I behind there? I am. Sorry about that. If you're humble before God, he'll, he will exalt you. He has called you to eternal glory. And then he himself will restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. That's standing firm in God's grace. These are all the things in these three, three and a half pages that we've been studying this time. Peter says, stand firm in this knowledge. That's a list of 20 items I just gleaned out of there quickly. Those are amazing promises, guys. Stand firm in and hold on to us. He's blessed us so abundantly. I think we should be able to stand firm just to bring him glory and honor. Okay, he concludes the letter. She who is at Babylon, who is likewise chosen, sends greetings to you. And so does Mark, my son. Greet one another with the kiss of love. Peace to all of you who are in Christ. Now we know that Babylon fell long before Peter authored this letter. So he's not talking about the actual place of Babylon where the Israelites were exiled to. But it's more than likely what he's calling Rome, which is where he was probably um, located when he wrote this letter. And so the she who is in Babylon is the church in Babylon sending greetings to them. Now Mark's identity is disputed also and some think this is John Mark who accompanied Paul on some missionary trips and others think this is actually the Mark who authored the Gospel of Mark and was an accompanist of Peter. And that one probably makes a little more sense to me because this is probably the Mark that was with Peter and probably was his Ammonaeus and wrote the letter for him. But either way, whichever mark it was, it doesn't really matter. It was just somebody that was obviously very active in mission work with, with Peter and Paul. Now, the, the neat thing about this is one of the things is Peter's always encouraging, and so does Paul, people to greet one another warmly. And I just want to lift you guys up 
in this church because this is one thing that Grace Avenue excels at. I know you guys know that I've brought guests here from from our church and it's it's really cool because every time I go back on back home and I talk to them on the phone they're like there's just something really special about the place the people there are just so warm and hospitable so good on you guys you you do a great job showing this type of uh, grace and love to other believers and it's a wonderful thing keep it up I wanted to encourage you to keep doing that it's 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 a wonderful thing for other believers to see you know we we talk about why we don't have it this much at Crossroads Church and I know the guys that I've brought down here really love to see that culture in our church up there too and the better thing about it is I know that you guys are bringing glory to God when you do it and it really pleases Jesus so just thank you guys and keep it up well that's it we got through it we got through first Peter now I hope this study has been as big a blessing to you as it has been to me I hope that we all have a fuller understanding of God's grace how much he loves us how much he cares for you and I hope this will help us to live as elect exiles being active members of God's royal priesthood and that we can cheerfully obey his calling upon our lives we need to remember that our lives are not our own our own we've been bought at a great price so we're gonna we're gonna uh, we're gonna go to the Old Testament next we're gonna go to the book of Nehemiah and I've really been praying for the Lord's guidance on how to teach that book and it was really neat because I think last week as I was sitting in here listening to the message he really kind of gave me an overall theme and a direction we're gonna go in that but as we move forward just remember to hold on and stand fast and firm in God's grace and, and he will equip us he'll empower us he'll strengthen us and we will do the things that bring him glory and the cool thing is is we can bring a revival to our homes our neighborhoods our communities and just pull lots of brothers and sisters into this lifeboat people that don't know they're your brothers and sisters but we can have that community here as, as long as we trust in him so let's pray hmm. Lord I thank you that you choose the weak and foolish things of this world to do your work to build your kingdom Lord God there's not one of us here that's worthy of, of your love your attention your mercy your grace your kindness and yet you choose to make us worthy Jesus you came and you walked with us you gave us your word you gave us your love your compassion you showed us how to apply the things that you've taught us in daily life so Lord I just pray for each one of us that we would more and more be shaped into your image that we would more and more be conformed to be your children that we as we walk every day that we would be that little bit tiniest bit more holy every day Lord that we would be that tiniest bit more sold out for you that in small ways every day Lord we would come to know you to trust you and to obey you more and more Lord and Lord that you would fill us to overflowing with your love mercy and grace that you want us to pour out onto a dark dark world Holy Spirit just have your way with us 
just have us be your children. Lord, we don't want to be a lukewarm church. We want to be a church that is on fire for you. We want to be a people that's known for our love, our compassion, and our, our, our warmth and hospitality. And for the fact that we love you and we worship you and we love to dance in your light. So Jesus, I just pray for every soul here, Lord, that um, you would bless them, you would keep them safe. And Lord, for those that aren't with us tonight, Lord, I pray, pray your blessing upon them also. Lord, just um, give us your boldness, your strength, and your courage as we go, in, go out into a world that is so deceived by Satan. And Lord, just let us be your beacons of light and truth. It's in your precious name we pray, Jesus. Amen.